All right, it's noon. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, first of all, for those who don't know me, I'm Shirley Paddock. I'm the uh, local chapter chair for the Women in Bio RTP chapter. And today is our Lunch and Learn with Sheila McHale. Sheila's gonna talk about you know, dense breast tissue, as well as the need for expanded insurance coverage for supplemental screening if you have dense breast tissue, along with no other um, major risk factors. So welcome, Sheila. Um, let me go ahead and put this on slide view. First of all, this meeting is being recorded for some reason. If you don't want to, um, you know, have your picture in the, in the, in the recording, just go ahead and, um, turn off your camera. There it is. Um, just a little bit about women in bio. I know we've got a lot of people on here. We've got people, at least from the list I received this morning, Southern California, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, and also in the RTP area. So this is a wide audience and I appreciate you all being here. But we are here for women. It's an organization of professionals to promote each other, careers, leadership, and entrepreneurial for all life science women leaders. This is our Women in Bio's continuity of support. I always say from the classroom to the boardroom, from academia to industry, from your first job to the last, and from, from idea to entrepreneur. So we do offer a lot in terms of mentoring, uh, executive women in bio, young women in bio, as well as an entrepreneur center. I do need to recognize our sponsors. We have a leading sponsor, Advanced Recruiting Partners, which we're very thankful for. Fujifilm, Arcadis, CSL Securus, um, Career Path Writing Solutions. Actually, Heidi is leading an event tomorrow night. So if you haven't registered for that, please do so. The DPS Group, UNC Kickstart Ventures, Roe, Ligon, and Resilience. So always want to thank our partners and our sponsors because they actually help make our programming happen. So why don't we go ahead? We've only got a, um, we only got an hour. I know I know that Sheila and, and others can talk for a long time on this important topic, and I hope Sheila we can leave room for Q and A in the last fifteen minutes of the show right. today. So, just Sheila, actually, if you're from the RTP area, she actually needs no introduction. But since we have people all across the world, or the the <laughs> seems like the world, the U.S., I thought I would go ahead. Sheila was recently named a 2023 Medicine Makers to the Power List for. Um, for 2023. In 2021, she was the EY US Overall Entrepreneur of the Year Award winner. She's started a lot of companies. She's co-founded a lot of companies and not-for-profits focused on children. Um, and she's recently the, the co-founder and former CEO of AskBio. And Sheila's goal is to make breast cancer detection more accessible to all women. And this is actually a call to action. So I know Sheila's gonna ask us for our help on some things. So I wanted to go ahead and just and just tee that up for you as well. So why don't I stop sharing and then see how do we how do we switch hosts? Karen, are you on or Yadi? Somebody help me. Yeah, I'm here. Let me see if I can. Um... Uh, check and see, Sheila, if, you can, if you're able now to share as a co-host. Okay. It looks like we are going to have success. Do you see it? Awesome. Yes. yes perfect. I love when it works. Okay. Great. Okay. So my topic today is about dense breasts, and I entitled it, Don't Be Dense About Dense Breasts. I was, and it om almost cost my life. So a little bit about uh, breast cancer. Um, more than 3.8 million women in the U.S. have a history of breast cancer. And sorry about that. That's my dog in the background, little Boo Boo, who wants to talk a little bit about this topic because it has affected him too. Uh, his mommy has been very stressed over the last several months. Uh, it is the most common cancer for American women. 264,000 U.S. women are diagnosed with breast cancer annually. And surprisingly, the incidence in the U.S. has risen over the past four decades. People don't know why, but more of us are getting breast cancer. And over 42,000 women die each year uh, from uh, breast cancer in the U.S. And that's a surprising fact because breast cancer, if caught early, is curable. Okay. 
So recently, the FDA had updated the mammography uh, regulations to require uh, centers to tell women their breast density. Um, and, but that information is almost like a bridge to nowhere because women uh, really don't know what to do with this information. And they are advised that they have dense breasts that they're supposed to talk with their doctors to determine if supplemental screening is required. But there are several problems with this um, that is, I experienced. One, doctors are not well educated about dense breasts. Uh, second, insurance often won't pay for supplemental screening, so doctors don't recommend additional tests. I can't tell you how many times during my journey when I was first diagnosed in November, I've heard the words insurance won't pay, uh, almost like uh, the doctors were deferring to insurance as the standard of care. Uh, and we'll talk more about that, and I think this is a really big problem. And then finally, women get contradictory information. And I'll also talk more about that. It's uh, very confusing, the messages that were told about dense breasts. So here's an example. Uh, I had uh, a mammogram in 2022, and I tried to do it every year. Uh, of course, you know things got a little uh, screwed up with COVID because uh, in 2020, many of the centers weren't open. And I got this. Um, as part of my mammogram report. It's on my electronic chart. And it says there are no suspicious, suspicious masses, calcifications, or other findings in either breast. That sounds good. It says there's no uh, evidence of malignancy. And I'm recommended to come back for a routine mammogram in one year. But then as a lawyer, I know, you know, notice that there's this language here that's sort of troubling says the breasts are heterogeneously dense, which may obscure small masses. And to me, that sounds like almost a disclaimer. So I went into you know, my charts and uh, they have this uh, mechanism where it explains each of the different components of what's being told to you in your mammogram report. And I think it's often for people maybe who um, are less educated or speak different languages. And so it says the breasts are heterogeneously dense. And what does this mean? May obscure small masses. And it just says when the breast tissue is dense, uh, this can somewhat limit the ability of a mammogram to find small or abnormalities. And it's normal to have dense breast tissue. So it doesn't sound like anything troubling, but still I asked my doctor and my primary care physician about the need for supplemental screening. And the responses I got was, no, there's no need. There's nothing abnormal in the mammogram report. Uh, tomosynthesis, uh, that's 3D mammals, are meant for heterogeneously dense breasts. There's no family history. Um, it's not the standard of care. And I also had physical exams two times a year. So they assured me that you know I was doing more than enough. And then there was this comment, but insurance won't pay anyway. And I didn't think much of it. Um, but I went back after I was diagnosed with bilateral breast cancer and asked my GYN about that. And uh, it was interesting because he said he didn't really understand uh, dense breasts and how they impacted breast cancer. And he also said, you know, insurance uh, is something that he often thinks about when he is prescribing additional screening uh, for any type of, uh, you know, disease. So, Insurance does uh, play a role in physicians' decision making. So, to my big surprise, in November 2022, um, I was just drying myself off in the mirror, and you know, I saw something—a dimple on my left hand side. And my first response was, "Well, what in the world is that?" Right? And it's a little bit more. It actually didn't dawn on me that I could have breast cancer initially. My first thought was, "Boy, menopause is really hard." I'm even getting cellulite on my boobs, right? It was the first response. And then it took me a day to figure out, oh my gosh, this can be breast cancer. And it was surprising to me because I had no lump. You know, I, I did my monthly exams and I had two physical exams by my primary and my GYN. There was no lump. I went in for a diagnostic mammogram on both sides. And then they saw, you know, what I had told them. And I had to literally, they marked it with a piece of tape and uh, they saw, you know, essentially that there was something there, a mass. I had an ultrasound on the left-hand side, had a biopsy on the left-hand side, 
And then unfortunately that night I had to leave for the EY Entrepreneur of the Year um, event uh, out on the West Coast. And so literally got on a plane uh, thinking, right, that I had breast cancer. Uh, 10 days later, and this is one of the things that is really horrible, I think, uh, in, as part of the process, you wait a long time. Uh, there's a lot of uh, anxiety that builds while you wait. 10 days later, I was told that I had breast cancer on the left-hand side. And my first thought was, wow, you know, mammogram missed the cancer because, you know, um, I had a mammogram earlier in the year. And then the second thought was, could have missed the second cancer. Uh, I was assured that I only had it on the left-hand side because uh, I had had a diagnostic mammogram and I assisted on a chest CT. Uh, I didn't even know what I was supposed to ask for. And I just remember when I had pain on my uh, lower right-hand abdominal side, um, I had a CT scan. So I asked for a chest CT. It wasn't the right thing to ask for. Um, and I was told insurance wouldn't cover it. And I said, I just, you know, I started saying self-pay, self-pay, because I was told those are the magic words. Um, and I was even told by the oncologist, right, that I was making a ruckus. And they scheduled it like several weeks out. And uh, I knew, um, you know, the board of the, one of the members of the board of trustees at Duke, uh, I had spoken at one of their annual uh, dinners a few years before. So I knew some people there and I got it moved up. But essentially I was told by the oncologist that I was making, you know, this ruckus. Well, um, the CT scan confirmed that there was a mass on the left-hand side and it said that the total malignancy was about 3.8 centimeters. Again, that was not detected by the 3D mammograms, uh, the tomosynthesis. But what was more surprising is there was also a mass, unfortunately, I wish I was wrong, on the right-hand side. And that uh, malignancy was about six centimeters. So um, pretty significant. And that was not detected by 3D tomosynthesis or by the diagnostic mammogram. And so there was almost 10 centimeters of total malignancy not detected. Uh, when I went up to Dana-Farber uh, based on calcifications, they thought the cancer was undetected for about five years. So, uh, this was pretty shocking to me, right? Because I went from, you know, being assured uh, that I had no cancer to being assured I had cancer just on the left of the side. And then finally to being, you know, finding out right after fighting for additional tests that I had cancer in both breasts and a pretty significant amount of malignancy. So, you know, based on my experience, I think there are a lot of problems with the mammogram reports. One, they're not written in plain English, it's like double speak, right? They say, yes, you know, you don't, there's no signs of malignancy, come back in a year. But then they say, yeah, but we might not be able to tell uh, if you have dense breast, if you have cancer or not. So it's sort of like, well, what are you saying to me, right? And um, I honestly think that legal disclaimer is a real problem because it says there's no responsibility. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, dense breasts, but if you have heterogeneously dense breasts, that means that 50% or more of the breast tissue cannot be seen by the radiologist. That's a lot, that's 50%, that's like a, you know, a coin toss. Uh, if you have very dense breasts, and we'll talk about these different categories in a moment, that means that 100% of the breast tissue cannot be seen by a uh, mammogram, including 3D tomosynthesis. And so, you know, I talked with uh, Robert Smith at the American Cancer Society about this. And he said, if you have very dense breasts, he, was, he doesn't know why anybody would get a mammogram. You should just, you know, do some of the other screening modalities. Uh, that was his perspective. Um, so this legal disclaimer, I don't like because uh, essentially, you know, you go for a mammogram, but it's sort of like, you know, they can hide behind, well, the cancer was obscure, uh, couldn't be seen because of this uh, dense breast issue. I also don't like the burden being shifted to the patient. Uh, the patient is told that it's their responsibility if they had dense breast to figure out what to do next. The patient is in the worst position. You know, for me, I'm busy running a company. I'm sure many others on this phone call are professional women. We don't really have a lot of time. We go to a doctor because we expect the doctor to be better educated about the matters with which we're consulting them. 
and we expect them to advise us. Now we have the burden to go and talk to a uh, you know GYN or a primary care physician, um, and often right this is the next thing uh, you know that decision they're not really well equipped. That was my experience to make that decision. The uh, person who's best suited to make that decision is the radiologist. Um, and you know instead what you get from the radiologist is a you know in in the radiologist report a clear uh, signal that everything's fine. In fact, you know, I'm sure many of you have had this experience. When you go to get your mammogram, you are told afterwards, you know, you get a thumbs up, you can go, right? You stay uh, basically in the uh, robe until they tell you that you're okay to go. So you get, you know, confirmation at the site that you're free to go, no additional screenings necessary. Then you get a mammogram report on your electronic record and you get, um, I got a letter in the mail. Uh, it seems to me that, you know, the radiologist in my case gave me three signals, right? That I was good to go. Uh, but there was this legal disclaimer that I had dense breasts and, you know, small masses may be obscured. Um, just by the way, uh, you know, six centimeters is the size of my thumb. I do not think that is a small mass, but um, anyway. And, you know, I think this is a real problem because false assurances are given to women. And I think uh, the false assurances are even worse in some ways than if you had not had a mammogram. And I'm not advocating that women shouldn't have mammograms, but, uh, you know, I think if you know that you have to be more vigilant and you don't rely on the mammogram, you know, I think I would have been much more um, vocal with my physicians and done more research about uh, dense breasts to know how to better protect myself. Um, so what went wrong in my case? And my case is not unique. I've met so many women, right, who have found themselves in this situation. Um, possible answers, you know, the radiologist misread, the mammogram equipment didn't work. Those are all possibilities, but the most likely was um, dense breasts, that radiologists have a much more difficult time reading um, in the mammograms with dense breasts and the equipment that we are told to use, uh, mammograms, 2D and 3D tomosynthesis, it doesn't really work very well in dense breasts. So what is this whole topic of dense breasts? Well, about 50% of women have uh, dense breasts. Um, and, you know, your dense uh, density of your breast it becomes uh, less dense as we age. And so you see, um, you know, there's more women in their 40s who have dense breasts. And then by the time you're over 60, there are fewer women, but this is a pretty big uh, issue. And it tends to be, you know, those of us who have a lower BMI uh, tend to have dense breasts. And, you know, I was always told I had fibrotic breast. Uh, that's just another word for saying you have dense breasts. Um, so there's a lot of us who have this uh, issue. And uh, again, physiologically, what that means is, uh, you know, breasts are made of fat and glands, and those are the things that make the milk, and it's held together by fibrous tissues. And the more glands and fibrous tissue a woman has, the denser her breasts. And the problem with that is that, um, as you can see on the lower right-hand side, if you have dense uh, breasts, it uh, shows up uh, as white. Um, and uh, that's uh, a problem. And I'll show you why in a few minutes. Um, when radiologists look at mammograms, uh, they can tell the density of a breast. And so uh, with a new uh, law, we're all going to be told our uh, density, although uh, the FDA sort of collapsed category C and D together just as into dense. Um, but here in North Carolina, we were told uh, if we were in category A, B, C, or D. Uh, categories C and D uh, are the more problematic. Uh, most of us fall in the heterogeneously dense uh, category. Uh, about 40% of women and then about 10% of women are in the extremely uh, dense category. And the problem with having dense breasts is dense uh, tissue appears as white on mammograms, but guess what? Cancer also appears uh, as white on mammograms. 
And as you can see the cancer hiding here, uh, this makes it hard for radiologists to see cancer in dense breasts. And as a consequence, uh, women who have dense breasts, their cancers are often much larger when they are found. And this is an important fact. 71% uh, of cancers are found in dense breasts, right? So uh, that's a big number. <laughs> and mammograms miss about 50% of, of breast cancers in dense breasts. So what do those two facts mean? That means that the women who need the best imaging tools, they're not getting them, right? Because the tools that are being offered to the women who are most likely to have uh, breast cancer are getting uh, screened by uh, tools that can't find it often. They find it as often as a coin toss. So that's a real issue. Uh, one other thing I forgot to mention, just to put this in perspective, one out of eight of us will get breast cancer. So these are really big numbers, right? Um, anyway, so the other fact, and this is something that um, was surprising to me, dense breasts are a risk factor in itself for breast cancer. And in fact, it's a bigger risk factor than having a family history of breast cancer. So in my case, I was always asked, do you have a family history of breast cancer? And I would say, no, I have no family history whatsoever of breast cancer. And it seemed like that was the, one of the uh, key determinants um, in, you know, into whether or not physicians were uh, going to take more care in monitoring uh, my breast health. Um, but in actuality, and I posted this, uh, on LinkedIn, there have been studies for a long time, uh, this is over a decade ago, uh, showing that dense breasts eclipse all other known uh, breast cancer risk factors. Um, and this is out of UCSF, but there's been many studies. This is just one that I pulled up. Uh, it's not unique. And in fact, um, this was discussed uh, about a month ago uh, in the New York Times that um, this is a possible new risk uh, for breast cancer. Again, it's not a new risk, but I think more people are becoming uh, aware of it at this point. And, you know, uh, we have been relying uh, as a society on mammograms uh, and uh, many of us are lucky enough to have centers that also have 3D uh, tomosynthesis, uh, DBT, uh, digital breast uh, tomosynthesis, uh, which does uh, find more breast cancers, uh, but it is marginally better. And I think that's something that's really important to know. I was always told uh, that uh, DBT was meant for uh, heterogeneously dense breasts like mine. Um, I have spoken to the CEO of Logic, one of the manufacturers of these machines, and, you know, he is very insistent on that uh, fact. But, you know, the studies uh, show that it only uh, detects like, you know, uh, 1.4 more cancers per thousand screening. So it's just marginally better. If you add an ultrasound after a mammogram, you can find an additional two to three more cancers per a thousand women screen. Uh, and this is all in dense breasts. Um, and if you uh, have an MRI, uh, that may detect uh, 10 or more per 10,000 women screened. And there's also another screening modality called an MBI, which we'll talk about in a minute. It's not widely available uh, in the US. So uh, I haven't really focused uh, much uh, on our talk about that. But again, you know, is 3D tomosynthesis meant for dense breasts? There was a study that just came out from Harvard and Stanford um, and showed that there's a high uh, false negative rate. Uh, it's 0.8 per thousand uh, tomosynthesis exams. And 67 of those uh, women which had the false negative, and again, that means they're telling you you don't have cancer when you have it, uh, had heterogeneously dense breasts or extremely dense breasts. Uh, and the rest had, uh, the other 33% had a prior history of breast cancer, which makes me a little anxious because I was told uh, as part of the surveillance that I would get 3D tomosynthesis. And again, it doesn't work in, you know, a third of the cases. So I, I'm not sure that I will be doing that. 87% um, of the missed cancers were invasive 
malignancy. So they are, uh, <laughs> you know, serious uh, cancers. And uh, even more alarming, 81% uh, had a grade of two or three. That means that they are larger uh, cancers. Um, you know, if you're not convinced that MRI is better uh, than 3D tomosynthesis for dense breasts, uh, there was a um, article in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2020. Again, this is, ladies, this is not new news. People, uh, I think the medical profession have, uh, I don't know, their head in uh, the sand. Um, you know, they're not telling us this information, but it concluded that among women with dense breasts undergoing screening, abbreviated breast MRI compared with tomosynthesis was associated with a significantly higher rate of invasive breast cancer detection. Um, and again, an abbreviated MRI, um, Will, I've talked with uh, the head radiologist uh, for breast imaging at Duke, an abbreviated breast MRI is cheaper, it's quicker, um, and it is uh, very effective in finding uh, cancer in women with dense breasts. Uh, the problem is it's not offered at very many locations. So why aren't more MRIs uh, being offered to women with dense breasts? And there's a few possible explanations. Our medical system is completely, I think, overwhelmed uh, after COVID and doctors are rushed and they have a lot of pressures to be quite frank uh, on making financial performance uh, metrics. Uh, you know, we have 15 to 20 minute appointments. And so I don't think uh, that they have the time on that kind of, uh, you know, treadmill to really be able to think about uh, all the different aspects of uh, their patients' treatments. I don't think they're well informed. In fact, uh, I know that there are studies that have been done uh, that uh, looks at uh, the um, quality of information about dense breast and screening that is possessed by uh, GYNs and primary care physicians relative to the radiologists, and they don't have anywhere near the quality of understanding uh, about dense breast and supplemental screening. Uh, insurance won't pay, and again, that's a key factor. Um, you know, a hospital doesn't want uh, to uh, offer a test to a uh, woman who can't pay. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, ethical issues uh, associated with that, maybe even financial uh, and uh, medical liability exposure. Uh, I've been told by one doctor that it's just, he doesn't offer it to anybody because he thinks it's just unfair to offer it to a woman who can't pay. So his practice is not to offer it to anyone. There's also uh, this notion that some cancers just shouldn't be treated. It's actually more detrimental to the woman to find the cancer and to treat it than just to let it be because it will never become anything problematic. I think that's a very flimsy excuse because one option would just be to surveillance that cancer, not treat it. Uh, I think most women would want to know if they are in the stage where um, it's like a precursor to cancer and they would want to uh, have the comfort of knowing that a uh, physician is following that. Um, this is the worst, uh, the next excuse uh, that I've heard. Uh, I think it's the most misogynistic um, thing that I've heard in a long time. We don't want to worry women with unnecessary biopsies to all the anxiety that a woman would be going through while she's waiting for 24 to 48 hours to find out if the biopsy uh, is positive. I mean, honestly, the amount of stress that you deal with, uh, finding out that your cancer is uh, large, maybe um, systemic, uh, metastatic, because it wasn't caught uh, earlier, really far, uh, you know, overweighs uh, a short-term anxiety. And there have been studies on this too that have uh, quantitatively determined that women would prefer to know if they have cancer, right? They will be willing to uh, endure the short-term uh, stress associated with um, the, you know, waiting to find out for sure. It, it's a really horrific uh, thing that doctors are, you know, considering, right? It is uh, so paternalistic, it just, it makes me nauseous. 
And then finally, the guidelines don't recommend. And um, we'll talk a little bit about the guidelines. The problem I have with this is the guidelines are retrospective and they wait for a really long time on a uh, sort of whole population basis before they make uh, changes. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, you know, us individual women uh, are not getting our uh, cancers timely diagnosed. There are other technologies uh, that could bridge uh, the cost, right? MRIs are more expensive and that's why insurance doesn't wanna pay for them. Uh, there's contrast enhanced mammography. It goes by all sorts of different acronyms um, and it has gotten uh, some pretty good reviews and um, it's more widely available in Europe. Today in the RCP area, it is not offered. I know Duke has um, a plan to implement it uh, in the near future. Uh, and this uh, uses an ion dated, uh, ion -dated uh, intravenous uh, contrast in combination with a standard digital mammogram and enhances uh, the uh, tumor vessels and allows for detection of uh, morphological changes in the breast. It's relatively cheap and quick. And one of the other things that people don't like about MRI is the use of uh, gadolinium. So it does not use that and that's beneficial. Uh, there's also MBI, molecular breast imaging uh, is an alternative. It's not uh, very frequently offered today. And it also has uh, the negative side effect of whole uh, body radiation, although at you know small manageable amounts. Uh, here in RTP, uh, it is not available. Um, and I also want to alert uh, people, I mentioned it before when I did my own uh, exams that some breast cancers uh, have no lump. Uh, and there's two different kinds of breast cancer. There's ductal, which begins in the milk ducts. That has a lump. Uh, and lobular, which begins in the milk producing glands, and that has no lump. You know, typically when we're told about our warning signs for breast cancer, we're always taught, you know, taught to look for the, the lump or the mass. Um, you know, I never had a lump or mass uh, that I could detect. Even when I went in for my last mammogram, uh, the technician asked me, did I have a lump? And I said, well, I have fibrotic breasts, right? My, my breasts feel like a bag of marbles, but I have no new lumps that I could detect. And, um, you know, in some ways, right, uh, that is really problematic for the, you know, up to 15% of us who have lobular breast cancer. These cancers tend to grow in uh, single file strands. So think of a spider web. And eventually they do create a, a hard mass um, at their center. They are uh, hard to detect by physical exam or mammography. They're typically found when they're much larger at more advanced stages. Uh, MRI though is a really good tool uh, for detecting them. And the only thing that I noticed, but I was also going through menopause and I was getting a little fatter, was that I had a feeling of heaviness in my breast. And that was uh, one of the telltale signs, but nobody really alerted me to that. So I'm telling you, if you feel heaviness in your breast, uh, that's something that um, you need to really, you know, follow up about. Uh, and the other thing that makes it hard to detect is it tends to be bilateral. So the changes I saw in my left breast, I saw um, the same on my right breast. Mine were not only bilateral, they were symmetrical. So it, there's just no way uh, for me to have self-diagnosed. It was only until I saw a dimple on my left hand side that I had you know, some uh, warning sign. And so it's really important to look at these uh, warning signs. Uh, for me, uh, the dimpling saved my life. There's no doubt about that. You know, and some people say, well, okay, you know, why is detection so important? I think, uh, you know, I've had this conversation with one of the insurance companies. Well, you know, is it real? Is early detection uh, really um, important for uh, ultimate outcomes? And it's the most bizarre question, uh, question I think, uh, to ask. It's really uh, unbelievable. But uh, I have been dealing with a lot of nonsense trying to get uh, supplemental screening covered by insurance companies. 
And here's, um, you know, a chart, right, that basically shows that if found early, most breast cancer is curable, but if it's found late, it can be deadly. The larger the tumor size, the higher the probability of metastatic disease. And they actually know, and you know, at what point uh, a tumor becomes uh, metastatic. Um, so, you know, it's just a silly, silly question. Uh, there's over 42,000 women in the U.S. who die, right, of uh, breast cancer every year. And I think, you know, ultimately that's why those of us who are responsible go to get screened every year so we can find our breast cancers as early as possible. Otherwise, you know, we go every five years or whatever, but we go every year so we can find it as quickly as possible because we want to avoid metastatic disease. So what should be done for dense breast? Well, quite frankly, there are other tests that are needed after a mammogram to detect cancer. Could be an ultrasound or abbreviated MRI. Uh, maybe contrast enhanced uh, mammo would be uh, appropriate uh, once they become more available. But women often are not uh, offered supplemental screening partly because insurance doesn't cover. That was my case. I you know, sold my last company uh, for up to $4 billion, $2 billion up front, and we uh, hit several of the milestones. I could have easily afforded uh, you know, the cost of a breast MRI. Uh, many women, though, are not as fortunate, and they cannot afford the cost of supplemental screening. So you know, I'm focused here on the status of North Carolina in particular. Um, there's currently 15 states plus DC have laws requiring insurance coverage for supplemental breast screening. Uh, only New York, Connecticut, and Illinois require such coverage without co-pays. Uh, North Carolina does not require uh, insurance coverage for supplemental breast screening. Uh, we do have, and we've had uh, for a while, a notification law uh, that indicates our uh, breast density. But again, I think that's a bridge to nowhere. You'll notice on this map, uh, one thing that I think is really interesting, the Midwest has been very progressive uh, in um, implementing these laws. And you have uh, some states that are really quite surprising like Texas and Georgia and Tennessee and Louisiana, right? Um, Massachusetts and California have been a little slower uh, in adopting laws that, based on discussions with Susan uh, G. Uh, Cohen they, Cohen, they expect that these two states will adopt the laws. They just have longer processes. In California, a study has to be done before a law uh, will be implemented and the study has been completed. In Massachusetts, it has to do just with their cycle of their uh, legislative uh, process. Um, but I'm very upset with North Carolina because we are supposed to be a biotech hub uh, and yet we are lagging behind states like Missouri and Louisiana. And I think that is actually quite disgraceful. Uh, it says something uh, about the priority of women uh, in this state. And quite frankly, I had started uh, recently a new company uh, down in Texas at J Labs in Houston, uh, Gerada Thin Films, which I had contemplated moving to North Carolina, but I will not. Uh, at this point in time, because this is an important enough issue uh, that I do not believe that North Carolina is women friendly at this point in time. And it's somewhat dangerous to live here uh, until the law gets changed. Um, is insurance coverage important? Yes, there have been studies that show that notification alone does not increase supplemental breast screening. Insurance coverage is a key factor in whether supplemental breast screening occurs, as well as MRI availability. North Carolina, we do not have enough MRI machines for all the women with dense breasts who would maybe want to get access to that type of screening. Uh, that's something where investments need to be made. Um, after the notification law was enacted, Supplemental breast screening in North Carolina did not increase, which really underlines the fact that just being notified is not adequate. Um, I think it's a matter of education and insurance coverage. Um, if you take an example like 
uh, New Jersey, uh, supplemental screening there increased 651% after the enactment of a notification law that also mandated insurance coverage. And I think that uh, is really an indicator that um, the standard of care that women receive really follows uh, the insurance coverage guidelines. Uh, there is a, a real push now. Uh, breast cancer screening has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, you know, Joanne uh, Pushkin, who is uh, one of my heroes uh, and is the leader in the dense breast area, uh, she uh, has been following what's happening in all the different states. Um, and uh, there's a real push now for uh, laws to expand no cost breast imaging, but this does not cover supplemental screening. I wanna be very clear about it. It just shows how far behind uh, the insurance coverage is for breast uh, screening on a nationwide basis. And here in North Carolina, I've been an advocate of House Bill 560 and it helps some, but doesn't help with supplemental breast screening. What this does is, is surprisingly, um, insurance uh, does not cover the situation where a woman has an abnormal uh, you know, screening mammogram. They find something and now she wants to have a diagnostic uh, mammogram to find out if she has uh, cancer or not, You know, additional uh, tests to figure out what's going on with the thing that they found in her screening uh, mammogram. Uh, and insurance uh, was, you know, could charge a lot more uh, for that diagnostic mammogram. And this law is important. Uh, it basically says that women would not be charged uh, more for that diagnostic mammogram than what she was charged for the screening mammogram. But it doesn't help us women uh, with supplemental uh, screening uh, coverage uh, where we have dense breasts. Um, we have a better chance, ladies, uh, with the national legislation. There was an act introduced by Katie Pork, who also had dense breasts. Uh, she probably got uh, better, uh, cover, you know, I guess health uh, monitoring than maybe a lot of us uh, would get. Uh, they caught hers very uh, early. Um, and, uh, but she is a very uh, conscientious uh, woman and she is trying to fight for others and she has introduced legislation uh, that is uh, called Find It Early Act. Uh, it died last year in Congress. It was recently introduced in the last uh, maybe two weeks and it ensures that all health insurance plans cover screening and diagnostic breast imaging with no out-of-pocket costs. And that includes supplemental screening with uh, for women with dense breasts or at a higher risk for breast cancer. So this is the law we need, but it's gonna be a fight because it's, uh, you know, how Congress is operating these days. There's a lot of uh, legislation, a lot of competing interests. And quite frankly, this will be costly for insurance companies. Um, insurance also uh, follows the guidelines. And I don't know if uh, you all saw that the US Preventive uh, Services Task Force um, issued updated guidelines recently, and uh, they recommend that women uh, begin getting mammograms every year starting at age uh, 40 rather than 50. Now, again, the USPSF is a little bit more conservative because other agencies have been uh, recommending um, earlier breast uh, cancer screening uh, before the age of 50 for some time. Um, and these uh, new guidelines apply to women at average risk, which includes family history and dense uh, breast tissue. So if you have dense breast tissue, you should start getting your mammograms at 40. Uh, women between the ages of 45 and 54 should have annual screening. You know, for a while I was told biannual, then annual went back and forth, but they're now very clear we should have annual screening. And they also concluded that there's inadequate information about supplemental screening for dense breasts, which I found really surprising given the uh, publications, uh, a few of which I mentioned, uh, including uh, the JAMA uh, publication that was very clear that supplemental screening found um, many more uh, cancers than uh, tomosynthesis found. There is a comment period until June 5, 2023, and I have advocated uh, all of uh, the 
uh, radiologists that I know to please uh, push for uh, supplemental screening for dense breasts and maybe the task force, right? I don't know, needs more pressure or education. I'm not really sure. Uh, it's surprising, um, but it is what it is. So there are a lot of inequalities uh, in breast cancer screening. Uh, you know, minorities, especially black women, uh, they tend uh, to uh, have a worse outcome, 40% more likely to die of breast cancer. And now you might say, well, maybe they don't get screened as frequently, but no, they do. They have the relatively same uh, screening percentage. Uh, it's really a, an issue of access uh, to 3D tomosynthesis, um, you know, breast MRIs. Uh, uh, black women tend to also have dense breasts. Um, you know, insurance uh, plan coverages are different if a company has a self-insurance plan, uh, if you have Blue Cross, you know, platinum premium, whatever. There's so many variations on what women are getting access to based on insurance plan coverage, which we all know is covered by, you know, determined by our employer. Um, rural versus metropolitan areas, you know, the people in rural North Carolina have access to different equipment uh, than uh, in the RTP area. Uh, there's inequalities based on wealth, education, so social status, and uh, I would argue dense versus non-dense because the uh, mammograms work beautifully for women with non-dense breasts. Well, for those 50%, it's great. But for those of us who are younger, who have dense breasts, uh, it doesn't work so well. Um, so this has been a really interesting uh, journey for me. And I just want to touch on one thing. Um, going through this, I had post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome, right? But not from the diagnosis. Uh, getting cancer was like, okay. Uh, but the process uh, was really tough. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, for me was really disturbing. You know, you, you are told you have cancer um, and you would think it, the system would be more supportive, but it was it was tough. It was the hardest fight. Right. And it took me 15 years to get my first round of funding. So I'm a pretty tough fighter. Um, you know, but this this was unbelievable. I had to fight for supplemental screening. Uh, you know, as soon as I found out I had bilateral, I had to decide on treatment, um, whether I had a mastectomy versus a lumpectomy, just having basically my breast removed and reconstructed or just removing the tumors and having radiation. And I was in the, you know, I was in the worst position, right, of everybody, uh, um, all my doctors to make that determination, but yet the decision was on you. So I did a lot of uh, reading of papers about my cancer, an interesting uh, lady's uh, mastectomy has um, a outcome, mortality outcome, that's just a few percentage points higher than a lumpectomy. Uh, if I recall right, it's about 3%. So I went the, with the lumpectomy. Um, that was the right decision for me at that time, uh, but it's a tough decision. Um, you wait a lot. You wait, which is, I think, the worst part. Uh, waited over 30 days for uh, biopsy and tumor analysis, right? Uh, do I have cancer? Uh, is it metastatic? That's a lot of waiting. Uh, waited two months, almost two months for tumor removal. And I do have to say, though, my doctor at UNC, uh, Dr. Um, Gallagher, was amazing. Uh, you honestly can't even tell that I have any, um, any, you know, any surgery, right? She was amazing. Uh, so in some ways, she was worth the wait. But on the other hand, two months of uh, thinking about your tumors growing um, is really just it, it does a, a number on your you know mental state. Um, I had to fight to get the tumors for future vaccines. Um, you know, if you follow Moderna and the work that they're doing, uh, the uh, cancer vaccines, their era is here now. And so I wanted my tumors for a personalized cancer vaccine. Uh, many places do not have process, even though you own them, they don't have any processes in, um, in existence for you to get access to them. And this was very difficult to get the tumors. It cost me uh, $15,000 in legal fees, right? This was uh, an issue. Uh, 
uh, radiation, our centers are overwhelmed. My radiation was scheduled uh, after 12 weeks, a little bit, you know, almost 13 weeks. And I was able to get it moved up. Um, but again, you know, another fighting. UNC did make the accommodation for that. I was uh, very grateful, but it just shows you how uh, stressed our uh, universities and medical centers are now. I had to get up daily, right? I was a seven ten slot. Uh, so I got up uh, every morning uh, before six for 66 radiation treatments. And that was uh, tough. I was trying to run a company while sick and many of us are in that area. Uh, that's uh, not easy. Uh, a lot of the doctors are rushed, poor communication with doctors. You get um, a lot of PAs and I even got uh, once, you know, I got a response back in my chart from, I am a per temp, per uh, DM temp worker filling in for the PA, right? They're just stressed. Uh, a lot of people uh, are missing after COVID and um, I don't think the system has been able to adjust. Uh, you find out a lot of things from uh, your electronic record, including the fact in my case that I had cancer um, and there's just a lot of uncertainty. Am I going to live? Am I going to die? And then I think the worst thing is um, you're almost like blamed for not catching it sooner. Well, you were told that the cancer may be hidden, right? I heard that so many times because I asked like, you know, I think a lot of us in biotech, we want to know what caused the cancer, which, you know, is hard to, it, it's hard to determine. But then, you know, the next thing is, okay, um, why wasn't it catched earlier? And I often felt like the blame was shifted from the medical system to me. Well, you were told, and you know, if you didn't get the right information from your doctor, you should have done more research. Well, again, you know, I hope I don't, you know, when I go in for a colonoscopy, I hope I don't have to do research to figure out, you know, are they doing the test uh, properly? Are they using the right equipment? Do I have to review my uh, test results? And uh, do I have to go in and talk with somebody to make sure, right, that are, that all the bases are being covered? It's an absurd uh, burden to shift onto uh, the patient. But ladies, that's what we're dealing with uh, in this situation. Um, and I think we, we need to change it. And, you know, the only reason why I was able to get back on my feet, literally, um, I did have to, you know, I stepped down from Mass Bio because I just, you know, could not manage uh, the company through all the treatment. And quite frankly, you know, it was two years after we sold the company, it was probably a natural time to transition. But my Mass Bio team was there for me all the way. And, uh, that was something that was really important. They were my support system. And for that, I will always be grateful. Uh, this is a picture when I completed my uh, last uh, day of radiation, I had a surprise uh, group of people uh, waiting for me. So it was really uh, quite nice. And, you know, uh, there's, I don't know, there's, you know, newspaper articles daily about this, right? Uh, women are getting caught uh, unfairly where their cancer is late stage when it's detected and they thought they were doing the right thing. They were getting their mammograms and they didn't know, I call it the secret, right? And this is very unfair. And, you know, it makes me angry. How many more will have to, you know, face this before change is made? And change is not going to come easy. <laughs> we're facing insurance companies who don't want to pay more. They are valuing our lives at 80 to $90. That's the cost of a mammogram. I think a person's life is worth a heck of a lot more than that. But we're going to have to fight for this. We're going to have to take this. Uh, this is not something that will be given for us. And it's quite upsetting. And so uh, one week after, uh, less than one week after I finished my last uh, treatment, I went back to Duke where I had my mammograms, um, you know, and I started handing out flower, uh, flyers about dead stress and the need for supplemental uh, screening. Um, and Leslie Ferris Yeager, who's been uh, a good friend who went through this uh, herself, this whole issue started an organization uh, and has been educating women. Uh, and she gave me uh, the information so I could distribute it. I actually asked, uh, you know, Duke why they wouldn't post uh, the flyers. And they told me, well, uh, it's a good idea, but compliance won't allow it. And I don't even understand what that means. 
But on Moral Monday, uh, I started uh, going to do and handing out uh, the flyers and talking to patients. And the question that I got over and over again, will insurance pay? And the answer is no, which is really uh, very upsetting. Um, we need we need to change the law. And there are women like Leslie who are working very hard. And, um, but you know we need help. And are you with us? And these are my two biggest heroes, Joanne Pushkin, who uh, runs an organization called Jed's Breast uh, Info. Dot com and she was really uh, key for the Find It Early Act and Leslie Ferris Yerger, who uh, runs My Density Matters. Uh, they both have websites that have a lot of information, but these are lawyers, right, who are doing it just because they're really concerned for other women uh, and uh, they are angels, but they, they definitely need our help. And so in conclusion, I just want to say, don't be dense about dense breasts, get educated, stay alive, inform others and save lives, demand equality uh, and equity and change futures. Uh, and um, I was able to get this uh, from Sandy uh, Minnick, who is uh, in Australia fighting for the Australian women. Uh, and I think this is an um, amazing uh, cartoon. Uh, it's basically, you know, what is the elephant in the room, uh, the dense uh, breast tissue, which often does not come to mind uh, by physicians when uh, women are talking with their doctors about uh, breast uh, cancer screening. So uh, with that, uh, that's all I have. And I thank everybody uh, for, uh, you know, participating and listening. And if there are any questions, uh, I will uh, be happy to take them at this point in time. Let me see if I can stop sharing. Thank you, Sheila. That was wonderful. Um, I appreciate that. I know we all appreciate that. This is very important to all of us, um, even, even ourselves, but also mothers, sisters. So thank you very much. There are a couple of questions in the chat. So if we do have some time, um, one, uh, one of the questions was, Curious if you had atypical hyperplasia. Yeah, I did, but it did. Uh, nobody had told me, right? My mammogram report was by RAD one, which said nothing suspicious. Uh, but when I had uh, the, uh, so I had the breast CT, and then I had a breast MRI, uh, and when I had the surgery, I had atypical hyperplasia. So yes, uh, I did, but I was never informed. Um, this one's not a question. Um, there, there's a couple in here about their experiences as well. So um, that's that's always important. The other one is is funny, but not funny, unfortunately. I know you mentioned the 80 to $90 for a life. Um, you know, somebody wrote in here that their ex got an MRI each time he fell from being drunk. Why can I have one MRI per year if I'm at high risk for, for or even if I have dense breast tissue, which is is asinine, frankly. So um, are there other questions out there besides, can we get copies of the slides? Yes, you can have copies of the slides. And again, I stole a lot of information from the two women that I gave credit to at the end. Uh, you know, they have just a ton of information on their websites, but we have to tell everybody. I mean, I've become an evangelist. I talked to my mailman, which I embarrassed him, right? <laughs> about this topic. I go to the store and I tell people, um, it's just, you know, it, it's really sad. Um, it's an easy way to save lives. You know, for me, I've worked in drug development for over two decades, and I need a scientific miracle breakthrough. I need to spend hundreds of millions of dollars, right, to develop a drug. I need at least 10 years to get it through clinical trials. And then, you know, there's less than a 20% chance that the drug is actually going to get in the market and help patients. Here, it's just taking the right screening technology and applying it to the, the right breast type, right? It's so frustrating to me because I, it, I don't understand why, right? Other than money, this money. isn't being done. It's just money. Sheila, speaking of money, do you have any idea what the cost would be, uh, either the, the self-pay or yep. any insurance I pay for supplemental MRI? Yeah, so if you get a full MRI, the insurance cost is 3000 You could probably get it for 1500 if you say self-pay. 
There's also an abbreviated MRI and the out-of-pocket is $400. The problem is the abbreviated MRI is not as widely available. Got it, thank you. A lot of comments in the chat. Really, really thank you for your presentation. Um, several members, several of the audience, you know, have gone through similar things. So I think this is great that you're sharing your experience and your awareness. And to Sheila's point, everybody, we do need to share this. There will be, you know, we'll send out the slides. This, this is a bit, this is being recorded. So we will send this out to everybody as well. We have a comment and question from an audience member who has had several mammograms in the past six months. Her doctor just keeps ordering more mammograms. And she wonders if there's a concern about the amount of radiation that women are being exposed to when they need these repeated mammograms. And could the radiation exposure actually be causing more cancer? So we'd love to hear your comments about that. Uh, than 2D uh, and more than MRI. So MRI, you know, at some point, right, I would ask your doctor, let's just do an MRI. I, I don't know why you would have so many, uh, you know, mammograms. And that's the thing that I think is really disturbing because I went every year right, for these mammograms, uh, taking in all that radiation exposure. And the worst part is, you know, the 40 pound of pressure, right, that is put on your breast as they make them flat into a pancake. They tell you, hold your breath. And it's like, really, is there any choice? Right? <laughs> I didn't know, I can't breathe. So, you know, again, look, there has to be innovation and it's coming. I've been researching um, these blood tests that look at circulating tumor cells. And, you know, there's a, a researcher out in California that has developed one with 99% uh, uh, accuracy, right? Five years from now, I think a lot of these problems, well, the regulatory system, okay, let's say eight years from now, a lot of these problems are gonna be resolved, but in the meanwhile, right? we've got to look out for ourselves. And so uh, what I have been told uh, by a lot of radiologists is if you have dense breasts, you get a 3D tomosynthesis, or you know, in Europe, they have the mammograms with contrast agent. Uh, you do that and then you get a, uh, you know, a breast MRI. Abbreviated is fine. Pila, do you mind sharing what stage your cancer was caught? At what stage? Yeah, it's basically based on the size. They, it was stage two, um, uh, but I have ER, PR positives or hormonal positive, HER2 negative. So, you know, they put you on these uh, hormone blockers and uh, the prognosis is good. But surely the key thing for me, when I went down uh, to MD Anderson, they said, I found it just in a nick of time. I started to get a lymphovascular invasion uh, and that is a precursor to uh, having it in the lymph nodes, literally in nick of time. And the, the cancer that was the most problematic was the one that they said I didn't have, right? The one that I fought to get the supplemental screening. So, I mean, honestly, you know, if you are diagnosed with breast cancer, the first thing I would ask for is a breast MRI to make sure you don't have it on the other side. They ask for it immediately right, and fight to get that test as quickly as possible. So out of everything, you know, I am a fighter. If I wasn't a fighter and I just, you know, went passively with what the system wanted me to do and wasn't making, quote unquote, a ruckus, um, my outcome would have been a lot different. Thank you. And I think just across healthcare, having been in the field for 30 plus years, that statement right there about being a fighter, a, a lot of women, a lot of patients in any disease don't know what questions to ask either. They don't know how to interpret what the doctor's saying. And it's, it, it makes for, it, it's, it's extremely unfortunate. So my advice there, I mean, a lot of people, when they get diagnosed with cancer, right, they keep it to themselves. I went very open. I went on social media and said, guys, I have this problem, right? and and I, I, I'm overwhelmed, right, emotionally, you know, physically. I'm just like, you know, not quite at shutdown, but I don't know where to go. And I had these angels, you know, other breast cancer survivors step up. I had a group of, you know, half dozen women who basically said, here's what you need to do. And so my recommendation is if you're faced with a cancer diagnosis, don't hide it. 
go out there and say, hey, has anybody had pancreatic, you know, uh, colon cancer? I need help. You don't have enough time to get educated. You just right. don't. So you really need people to uh, successfully navigate it through the system. And don't think for a moment, your doctors are overwhelmed. They're well-intentioned. They're overwhelmed. And you have to be very much aware of that. You need to really, you know, get somebody who can advocate with you. Agreed. Well, thank you. I know we're running over time, but Sheila, again, this has been wonderful. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule and your advocacy schedule and your fighting schedule to join us today. So really thank appreciate you, it. Um, and just a plug for tomorrow. We have an event tomorrow evening for... Help, getting help with writing your resume and a little networking as well. So for those of you here in the Triangle area, we'd love to see you there.